I want to give a warm welcome to Kim Fowler. Uh, Kim is a professional planner and sustainability expert with over 30 years of experience working with local governments in Canada. Uh, I believe, Kim, I remember you from when I was uh, younger in my career, uh, when you were in the, in the Fraser Valley leading work on ah, green, yeah. green roofs, if that's right. Is that right? Am I got the right? Oh, Kim Fowler? where was I? I was, I was the manager of planning in Chilliwack in 2000. There you go. Yes, there we yeah. go. Um, manager of long range planning, sustainability and energy with the regional district of Nanaimo. Uh, she's been awarded uh, PIBC's Outstanding Achievement Award for innovation and advocacy in her work. And she's also um, was the project manager for the redevelopment of Victoria's Dockside Lands, which was uh, award winning preeminent development in its day. That's what I remember you from, Kim, um, back in the early 2000s. Um, and took part in the first green roof regulation in Canada, um, which is another um, early milestone in your career that I remember when I was just, just new in this space. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, you're going to share a little bit about um, asset management, uh, kind of a, re a review and refresher for those who aren't, uh, you know, we have lots of folks here who are from the finance department and from planning, um, CAO. So lots of folks who aren't in the day-to-day -day of asset management. So we're really happy for you to come and, and share. So I'll pass it over to you. Good. Okay. Um, and uh, what I'm going to do is give you some sort of basic uh, definitions and the process of asset management, which it has to do so that we all have the same uh, baseline. And then I'm going to talk to you about some of the impacts of climate change, which you don't need to, I'll keep short because you don't need to see it. Um, you already did this summer. Um, and then I'm going to show you some of the work that we're doing uh, on climate action in the regional district of Nanaimo, which is where uh, it said I currently work. So um, definitions, and I'm gonna look sideways because my tiny screen's not big enough, but I took this right off the Asset Management BC website um, and you know, instead of cutting and pasting and making all little thingies, but it's a process. And that's the key thing we ended up saying. You don't come out and say, Here's my plan, I'm done. My asset management plan, we're done. Stick it on a shelf with all your other useless plans that you never use. Okay. <laughs> it's a process. And one of the key things that I'll show you is sort of when we get to what we call the wheel, which we've done uh, asset management BC. I'm an inaugural member from uh, when we created asset management BC. And back in 2008, I represented the um, Planning Institute of BC. And what we've said is it's not, it, it's a continual process. Start anywhere but for Pete's sake, start. Um, and you get started and then you uh, improve as you go around the process. So it's a process, it's not a plan. It, and that's what I said, a journey of continuous improvement that involves everyone in local government. So it's not just the finance people, it's not just toss it over the dirt cubicle to those engineers and you don't need to look at it anymore. Um, you actually need to include planners because we, we bring in the infrastructure through land use planning and we can substantially reduce cost by changing land use. So um, so it's a process of integrating people's skills and, and actions with information about the community's physical infrastructure assets and financial resources to ensure long-term sustainable service delivery. And it is about service delivery. That's what we're trying to keep. That's the whole purpose of doing asset management um, and building the resilience through that. And sound asset management practices support sustainable service delivery. That's what I said we were talking about that. What's sustainable service delivery? Uh, it's how we provide water, sewer, roads, parks, recreation, or community that fosters its social, environmental, and economic well being. And there are several service, there, there, there are services for residents and businesses that expect and depend on future generations will rely on. So uh, it means ensuring current community service needs are met. So doing a review of that. Supporting service delivery that meets their triple bottom line, helps future generations meet their own needs. So it's not just the current status, uh, considers community priorities and reflects balance of trade-offs between available resources and desired services. You actually have that conversation um, and not just once a year at the budget or once when uh, your assets are failing. <laughs> so this is the, the process really and assets are built infrastructure, or I call physical infrastructure, and natural assets. And I'll talk to you a bit about that too. We use to provide services like clean, clean drinking water, wastewater management, fire protection, libraries, parks, recreation facilities, and much more. So you know this, and I, I, I don't need to go into any detail, but 
We provide as local governments 60% of the infrastructure in this country on eight cents on the tax dollar. It's not sustainable, um, uh, but, uh, and we have at least a $200 billion infrastructure deficit across Canada, just at the local government level. I think that's closer to 400 billion, um, but I haven't gotten any new stats since actually a number of years ago, but I'll show you some more information on that. But this is not optional infrastructure. It is the core backbone of our communities. It's not optional. We need to do a better job of lobbying. We need to do a better job of, you know, FCM's number one priority now is to negotiate a new deal for local governments financially. It was just in a new BCM session presenting last week and the province is reviewing all of the financial uh, aspects of local government. I think DCCs will be changed. I think CACs, community amenity contributions will be gone. They may even delete zoning bylaws because uh, planners have this terrible habit of updating these wonderful new official community plans. Yay, they're so great. They're so everything's in there, 200 years of work program. And we leave our 1970s zoning bylaw uh, untouched because it's you know hard lift, difficult stuff. And uh, that's what uh, regulates land use, not the OCP very much. So there's a lot of changes that are needed uh, to go on. And um, so this is really a, a basic element of what we call the wheel. And so what does it mean? The first one, the first step really is an inventory. What do you own? Where is it? Uh, what is it worth? The next step is condition. So what, you know, what condition it is? What do we need to, uh, to do to it and when? And how much money do we need? For example, when I was director of, of uh, development services in Port Coquitlam back in 2006, our manager of engineering came out and said we were only maintaining roads to um, 16 of the 20 year standard. And so I wandered down one night down to the basement when he was sitting there in the dark with his two big screens. And I said, really, what does that mean? And he says, I've given up, Kim. He says, I keep asking for maintenance funding from uh, the Public Works Committee and they won't give it to me. So um, we now report that. Um, you know, we'll only have, uh, we have to we do major repairs to the road at 16 years instead of 20. Um, and so it's making sure that you know what the condition is in and therefore then what, uh, what we found in practice is if you do this, you can extend the life of assets. So instead of just 20 years, you can actually uh, have a road uh, for 25 years, you know, before you have to do a major uh, replacement to it. Levels of service, that was also one key thing. Um, as I said, do we still need it? Do the regu What do the regulators require? We know that things like water uh, quality standards keep going up um, and all other environmental regulations usually do. And what are the public's expectations? So the public and your elected officials and everyone else will understand what levels of service are. That's how they understand asset management. Not all the other stuff, but it's at an entry point oftentimes I've said it, you know, logically it starts with your inventory, your condition and your levels of service and, and then consider your risk, but you can start anywhere on this uh, wheel. And there's a more detailed wheel of the, of the actual steps to go to on the Asset Management BC website. We are the ones that created the wheel back in oh, yeah, 2009, I'll guess. Um, and so that's kind of what's um, really the key uh, and having the engagement that's with your community as well. Because what I've found is what the level of service that we're currently providing is up here. What we're actually funding is down here. And you have to have the conversation about uh, we're going to have to reduce the level of service. No, 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 no. Well, then we can um, increase taxes. No, 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 no. Well, then you have this conversation about where uh, we can no longer uh, fund infrastructure on debt. Um, the uh, condition on the right to know what you own. Uh, what condition is it in um, and how much money do you need in order to maintain that? And the example I used is roads on the average are 20 years. So have you put enough money away to maintain it to the full life cycle uh, of 20 years? And what we find actually said is we can extend the life cycle when we do pro proper maintenance. Then levels of service, uh, what do regulators require? Um, what are the public's expectations? That's the engagement you have with your community, your councils, or your boards. Um, and that's really what I understand. Now, really key what a level of service is. How many kilometers of roads do you have? How many swimming lessons do you give a year? How many parks do you have? What kind are they? 
you know, that's when really a level of service is. And uh, then you have to consider risk um, and the climate, as we were already pointing out when I came on here, you were talking about the increasing risk of climatic uh, change events, but there's other types of risks. So it's identifying what those are and having a conversation about where you're vulnerable. So one of the things we're doing um, this fall is our natural asset inventory. I'm going to be identifying what the key natural assets are um, for a whole variety of reasons, but then we're going to do a risk assessment of them. Um, and so climate risk assessment of them so that we actually know which ones are vulnerable and which ones actually should we acquire, should we protect them, should we do uh, development permits, which is, uh, I have time, I'll get to the ones we're doing for uh, aquifer protection, environmentally sensitive areas, which include trees, shrubland, and wetlands, and then our uh, hazard lands. So you flip the next slide. So sustainable service delivery, this is again, one of the keys we use. And I said, it really is this uh, uh, continuation, um, including information and communication. Um, when we sure said, really what we need to do is make sure that we communicate this, to, particularly in increasingly risky uh, circumstances. Um, but you have to understand service, understand your cost and what funding is available, both yours and any federal or provincial uh, programs and understand your risk. And then you make good decisions um, as a corporation. I have, and to say that as a, as a professional planner, um, asset management's not optional. Everyone's doing it already. It's all a question of how well you're doing it. I don't know how uh, a local government does its budget, even if you do an annual, just annually, however you do it, um, you need to know what your assets are. You need to know what condition they are and you need to know what funding is to keep them. And I said, this is not optional. These are. You know, roads, water, and sewer are the, are the backbone of our communities. And uh, this is the process that we've been working on in, in Asset Management BC for since 2008 to improve this. And we do have communities of practice. I don't know whether there is one in the north. We have one in the mid-island here as well that does the support for that. Can you switch to the next one? This is a 2019 Canadian Infrastructure Report Card says, and that's the most recent one, 40% of roads and bridges are in fair, poor, or very poor condition with roughly 80% more than 20 years old. 20 years old is the end of life for most of them. 30 to 35% of recreational and cultural facilities are in that fair, poor, or very poor condition. And pools, libraries, and community centers, some are more than 60% are at least 20 years old. Um, that should be nothing new to those of us working in local government. Uh, and 30% of water infrastructure, such as water mains and sewers, are in fair, poor, or very poor condition. So the issue here is, is that the infrastructure went in, uh, a lot of it in the 60s and 70s, or 50s even, um, and it's reaching the end of its useful life. And that is the big infrastructure uh, funding gap that we're dealing with. And that's really why the level of service is so key, because you end up saying, um, we've lived beyond our means and a whole variety of ways. This is just another one <laughs> basically says um, we've enjoyed services that we haven't fully paid for. And so uh, this is the piece where we end up having to go back and talk to our communities about what those issues are uh, and what choices are. And out of the three and a half decades I've done community engagement, you always give adults choices. You don't come out and say, this is my one recommendation. This is it. And then wonder why, because I've talked to a lot of engineers, why it gets shoved down their throat and people get angry in public meetings. They don't want to be told what to do when they want to understand what the issues are. They understand it when they have options. They uh, see the differences. They answer half their questions. And then you end up with a better outcome. Um, but these are these conversations that we have to have with our communities um, regarding these our, our assets. Next slide, please. So I've already said this, but it said 200 billion is about 13,000, about $14,000 a household across Canada. This is about eight or nine years old. So it's probably more than that now. So they're saying, I think we're closer to 400 billion. Um, and we own as local government, 60% of the core public infrastructure on eight cents on the tax dollar. Province gets 42 and the feds get 50. That's not fair. And uh, it means that we're not able to address existing needs, let alone any of the futures. So understand that there is this funding gap. We don't call it a deficit because those of you who are accountants will uh, under 
will uh, cry because it doesn't meet the definition of, of deficit. It meets, it's a funding gap. You have the next slide, please. So in 2022, Asset Management BC does a report card for BC. And what we found is over 50% of local governments have developed a, a formal asset management process. That's an increase of 24% since 2016, yay. We did a review in 2009 and found 60% didn't know what they own, um, let alone do asset management. So it's been a, a very big improvement. Um, uh, but I have to tell you, the voluntary time is coming to an end. The province is doing a financial review, as I said, and I think you'll flunk your audit if you don't have a capital replacement estimate, your annual audit, um, and then it'll ramp up to meeting an asset management plan fully integrated into your financial plan. I don't think those are optional things uh, to cry about someone downloading or doing something. This is really basic stuff. If you own a house or you own a car, you don't just live it and drive it and don't Look at what the maintenance is. Don't look at replacement costs. Don't put money away for replacement. This is the same thing for local governments. And we're not talking about a car or um, a house. We're talking, well, you know, we do have some houses, but it said the uh, this is really essential core services. And so what we found is that uh, about 50% of local governments have developed an asset management strategy, uh, which again is a significant increase since 2016. Uh, just under 50% of uh, reported integrated asset management activities and long-term financial plans, and over 25% have developed asset management policies. There's easy ones. We have models on the Asset Management BC website uh, for boards and councils, and over 66% have developed at least one asset management plan. Start on your roads. That's the most underfunded one usually, or water, or sewer, or your parks building, or your civic buildings, or, or, or start somewhere. Um, assessing an integrating level of service and risk remains a challenge. And so that's really where we're focusing and, and talking about levels of service uh, and dealing with uh, exponentially increasing risk, both liability and climate action. We'll talk a bit more about that. Next slide, please, thanks. How did we get here? I've already talked about this, but it's reactive instead of proactive. So there's one where you have a 30 year maintenance cost of 80,000 uh, because you just waited until the road failed and got to a very poor condition, which is said with majority of our roads are in in Canada um, versus it actually, if you put in just a little bit of maintenance every year, uh, you end up with a 40,000 or maintenance cost. Um, and really asset management, it's not just about capital replacement cost. It's also about maintaining it, your assets to their full life cycle or in what we've now found is you can being able then to extend it um, and saving money. And talking to your community about how many potholes they're willing to have in the road, if they know what the costs are uh, of replacement, what impact that's gonna have on their taxes. Those are conversations you need to have or you can have with your community on regarding these. Next slide. We don't recover costs and fees. I don't get me started on uh, DCCs. They're called development cost charges. I call them doesn't cover costs um, because we're not actually legislatively allowed to cover fully recover for costs. We don't get to recover for the costs of fire, ambulance, community centers, um, fire protection, all of those costs, which actually the done to general public funds and development. But we also don't recover uh, fees in uh, the regional district of Nanaimo. We, uh, the taxpayers in the RDN fund 95% of planning fees. We only cost recover 5%. That in my opinion is completely unacceptable. And you need to have these conversations so that you understand uh, what happens because when ends up with all this development that's going on, the existing tax base is funding uh, more than 50% of new costs of new development uh, that local government is, is uh, doing. So these are things that are uh, that we need to review. Um, the 80-20 rule you use in asset management is, and you can see on the right, capital costs. So we always talk about the sticker shock. We're going to build this new pool. I'm trying to build one in RDN for about five years. Um, and it's, oh my gosh, that's so much money. Could you just reduce the cost somewhere? Cut this, cut that, cut out the, you know, what we call the uh, social infrastructure. Don't put in that nice, you know, cafeteria or that nice park central area for people to meet. Oh, take out that slightly more expensive, although, uh, you know, HVAC system that's that has some uh, recycling. 
uh, on it. What we're finding now is they're actually not that much more expensive. Oh, but to cut that down. You shoot yourself in the foot because 20% of the cost of the life cycle of a building, in this case, um, is the capital cost. 80% is operations and maintenance, that stuff that's under the water there. And so you're insane if you own a building and you cut down the cost and massively increase your operation maintenance costs to save a few hundred you know, dollars or hundred thousand dollars or whatever it is on the capital cost because 80% of your cost is operations and maintenance. On top of the fact that the building code is, keeps ramping up and you're gonna to have to, when you do renovations, put in the new system. So that's one of the key things we talk about um, in, in terms of asset man management and understanding capital costs um, and your operations and maintenance cost and using full cost, uh, full life cycle costing instead of just what, yeah, the, the sticker capital cost. Next slide. And as I mentioned already, I said, you need to start anywhere, uh, but I said, please do start. Um, and that's really uh, key. Uh, and I said, it doesn't, it makes sense, obviously, for most people to, to find out what their inventory is. And if we're required, as I expect, to report on our capital uh, replacement costs, you do need to start that. Um, but you can start a level of services. I said, you can start on one type of, of asset. Um, I said, your bridges or your roads or your parks or your rec facilities or whatever, your water, your sewer, pick one. Uh, but start anywhere now. Um, because I said that it, it's besides just basic good practice, I won't even say uh, uh, it's basic practice. I, I think from a professional perspective, you're in malpractice if you're not doing this. Next slide. Sustainable asset management means decreasing infrastructure deficits, uh, minimizing disruptions in service levels and spikes in property taxes. That's what happens if you don't do asset management. Um, and we're going to we're seeing significantly more increased disruptions um, and spiking in property taxes to pay for it. Uh, connecting organizational priorities to its budget implemented by integrated plans. You, your uh, if you have an asset management plan, it's going to drive your capital plan in your financial plan, which is you know seventy to ninety percent of the value of your corporation, um, and it should be integrated with those plans and then drive what your uh, strategic plan priorities are as well. Mitigating and adapting to climate change, you already know this, um, and improving community resilience. So this, this slightly longer term planning, better looking at things improves the community resilience, which when you have a significant events like forest fires allows you to bounce back better. One, to endure them, uh, but uh, the, the bounce back is key. That picture I put in it, nine o'clock last night. It's my uh, permaculture garden or the side of it, which used to be a desert. So I've spent a number of years um, uh, building it up so that, um, well, actually my community uh, member, my neighbors really like it, but I said, so do the bees and the birds. <laughs> Next one. And I'm going to say, use your pay or we all fall down. Understand the full cost of services and determine sustainable service delivery. Um, and yes, I know that's difficult as a staff to tell your council and your board. Uh, it's better than explaining to them why the system failed or why you don't have any money or why they get to a crisis point. Um, you need to have this conversation. I think Oak Bay is probably one of the best ones. It used to be one of my worst case studies. And they have a new director of finance who went in and actually did the review, did the asset management plan. Uh, they put 2% away for their uh, assets now annually. 2% uh, of their uh, property taxes. That was an increased fee that was added. Um, they've now built all of that out and, and have now influenced their uh, strategic plan and they won an award for it at UBCM last week. So there's the worst case scenario I know of that's actually done the work. So uh, why fees and charges need to be cost recovery? Okay, because if it doesn't, then the general tax pace does. And when I was in the city of Red Deer, we did a review of uh, the societal benefits of providing, for example, transit and swimming lessons. Um, and so you can subsidize up to that amount. Um, but some other fees like planning, you're giving a subsidy directly to a private uh, developer. Those th things need to be questioned um, and reviewed. And one of the things I just put in here for urban sprawl, because I'm a planner, 
but has a significant impact, as I mentioned, on land use. Uh, 60 to 80 percent uh, and motor vehicle travel by 20 to 60 percent when you sprawl versus infill or do higher density. You lose the economies of scale or agglomeration efficiencies and increases infrastructure cost up to three times more than smart growth neighborhoods. Actually, the city of Prince George did a review of this and using the uh, CLIC tool, the Community Lifecycle Infrastructure Costing Tool, which you can find on the province's website. Um, and so they did and showed the difference, a uh, huge difference between even sort of an uptown infill versus a sub suburban development. So there's there's tools out there to do that. Next slide, please. I don't need to explain this to you, but the um, climate change risk is, is substantially increasing. You can see the climatological ones, uh, hydrological, meteorological, um, um, but it's those uh, floods and storms significantly increasing. And that's from 19, read my slide sideways, 19, what, 80 there to 2017. Fairly short period of time uh, for a significant increase. Can you flip to the next slide, please? And what we're finding is now the one in 100 year storm is now the one in 25. The one in 25 is now the one in five. I used to say that one in five is now the one in two and I had an engineer tell me it's the one in one. So what used to happen every 100 years, the big storm, 100 year storm used to use for uh, storm sewer design, for example, um, is now the 25 year storm. So occurring four times more often than before. Uh, one in five is now the one in one, so it occurs five times more often than it used to. Just means the significant the amplitude and the is significantly increasing of these uh, the severity of them and the return period is shortening. That's another way to say it. So we have extreme rainfall, prolonged drought, and wildfire risk, um, and we have to also manage the longer term sea level rise increases. You switch to the next one. Canadian Institute for Climate Choices has estimated the cost of climate change to road infrastructure is one to two billion dollars per year uh, for local governments in Canada and one billion per year for electrical infrastructure. They advise 50 to 90 percent of that damage can be avoided with modest infrastructure investments. Your asset management plan, do the infrastructure investments, lobby the feds in the province to stop giving us chump change and start giving us some actual money that we can use uh, sustainable funding um, to be able to actually address this very significant risk in our country about our aging infrastructure that needs to be replaced. And it's being hammered three to five times more by climate change now. And what they also say the time to adapt is now. Proactive adaptation can avoid most risk. Imperfect information must not be a barrier. And that's the key thing. I've worked with engineers for several decades on this and said, we can't give you the information, Kim, because it doesn't meet our professional standards. It's not good enough. It's my Excel spreadsheet I have jammed to my little computer on the side. And it doesn't really meet any standards. It's the only thing I have to run my budget. Fine, give it to me. We're gonna put it in an asset management plan and improve it as we go. Oh, human condition is imperfect. Uh, you have to get started. Lack of political will can no longer be one of the biggest risks. And that was in that report. Next slide, please. Um, we have a choice of being resilient or responding and recovering, or just you know responding to events. These in, having increased time spent responding and recovering to climatic events. To, <laughs> I need to explain that to you. Operational staff already spend eighty five percent of their time responding to failed infrastructure assets. So that's your public works crew, your parks works crew. They spend most of their time now running around sticking their finger in the dike. That needs to change. And when you do asset management, you need to go and talk to those people because they know more about the condition of your assets and what needs to be replaced and what are the big risks. Local governments own 60% of it said on eight cents in the tax dollar. That really is a business case for resilience. Next slide, please. This is uh, September. What is it? No, whatever. The um, marine. Um, oh, thank you. That we had in 2021. And that's, I'm just going to show you some pictures. That's the uh, both bridge separated highway, two lane highway, both of them blown out. Coca Cola near Hope. Flip to the next one. 
120 meters of the Trans-Canada Highway gone near Othello, Highway 5. And another one over there, but it said this one, Highway 1, Sumas Prairie, um, the Sumas Lake reappeared <laughs> that had been filled in and diked. Um, the key thing about that is the city of Abbotsford, the Fraser Valley Regional District and the province are being sued for gross negligence because uh, people were not notified before the water appeared in the lots. Um, I know the MLA, uh, who was the Minister of Agriculture at the time, Lena uh, Popham, uh, she said she had farmers uh, um, phoning them from the second story watching their livestock drown. Next slide, please. And uh, tens of thousands of livestock uh, perished in that. So we said that's part of that court case. Highway 1 near Lytton. Uh, on the left, you see, is the spot on the right. You see x the forest fire was occurred in the summer. The flood occurred in the fall. Uh, the forest fire uh, basically makes the, the ground hard, solidifies it, uh, and that increased the runoff, which uh, destroyed this portion of the highway. Flip to the next one. Um, and this is, so it was November 15th, 2021. I had my uh, dates wrong, but it said, so that was uh, the atmospheric river we had. So we had one month's rainfall in one day. Uh, on the left, um, you see actually that this is a twi uh, Twitter, whatever it was, Twitter <laughs> picture. And uh, this guy is going down uh, the Malahat Highway, the Mal the portion of the highway that's on the Malahat, and it's full of water. Now, the odd thing about that is if you look to the right, you can see where the uh, it drops way off. <laughs> so you wonder why isn't it drainage? If you look on the left, you can see those little dividers. They have tiny, tiny drainage holes. That's why. <laughs> and so uh, for the first time in British Columbia history, you could not get out of lower mainland through Canada. All three or four, I mean, call it the uh, major highways, gone, blocked. Um, the Trans-Canada Railways, blown out. We had to get our, our uh, trucking stuff through the United States, which luckily didn't get as bad a storm uh, to do this. And uh, for Lytton, uh, that's why I use that example, they were the hottest, 39.6 degrees, hottest uh, temperature, temperate, or, you know, our, our uh, latitude in the world, hotter than Death Valley that day, hotter than any record. Uh, and they were like that for the better part of two weeks. And then, um, as you all know, they uh, burned in an hour and a half. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm losing my uh, voice here. So the, uh, uh, it burned in an hour and a half, uh, two days later. Flip to the next one. And that's where you can see um, uh, Lytton at, at uh, sorry, 49.5 degrees centigrade. I'm not reading, I don't see my notes on this slide. Um, but so that shows you, as said, those events. And uh, just switch to the next slide, and 595 people died in that heat, heat wave. So it's also, and 80%, almost 80% of them were uh, 70 years and older. So it's a social impact as well. Uh, it's one of the things to consider. Can you flip to the next one? And that was our bomb cyclone we had yesterday. So we've used these terms like terms, bomb cyclones, um, uh, marine rivers, uh, all, you know, uh, heat waves, all of those uh, heat domes, all become new terminology for us as this risk increases. Thanks. Next one. So regional district of Nanaimo, uh, just going to give you some examples because uh, uh, anyway, put some uh, actuals uh, to this is that we have about 172,000 people. We've grown 6% between 2016 and 2021, which is fairly high growth rate. We have five member municipalities and seven electoral areas. And um, and we also have the Mount Air Smith Biosphere Reserve, the UNESCO Biosphere Reserve there on there. So essentially we go from the sea to the top of the coastal mountains or the Vancouver mountains. Um, and uh, we have at least, if you flip to the next one, or I have one of these slides anyway, I'll show you our, uh, our uh, we have, uh, seven watersheds as well. One of the things we're working on is a sea level rise project where we've mapped all 180 kilometers of that shoreline, updated our floodplain maps so the only three rivers for which we have provincial mapping. It costs millions to do it otherwise. 
risk assessments for our significant assets. We've integrated uh, that into our asset design, including park services, pump stations, and our wastewater treatment uh, plant, the largest capital project in the region's history that just completed last year. Let me move to the next one. So what is this? We It's now in year six or seven. Uh, when we originally started this, we did a region-wide assessment for flood risk. We did the, as I said, three rivers, Englishman, Little Qualcomm, uh, the Nanaimo, which we are actually are finished now, and we did the coastal. I want to flip to the next one. There are seven watersheds. And we have a drinking water and watershed protection program for which we use all this data. They give us data, we put it in our regulations for planning. Next slide, please. So for this river flood mapping, I thought you'd find it interesting. Six scenarios, bank full, 10-year storm, 200-year storm, current and future. And then we looked at what buildings would be inundated, people affected by that inundation, transportation disrupted, and which service, municipal service infrastructure impacts. Flip to the next one. This is the sea level rise. Well, it's we did it for both sea level rise and the river. So this is what shows you, and I just, I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly, then I don't have uh, a lot of time, uh, but it said that it shows you the impact of both the 10 year return and the 200 year is the lighter shade, darker shades of 10 years. So you can see the impact on people, the roads, houses, and infrastructure. So that's kind of the modeling we did. Next, most of this was actually funded through the provincial and, and uh, federal emergency response planning and for which I have a staff member who's absolutely outstanding at doing grant applications. Uh, we have got this over five years. Regulatory flood mapping approach we've used. Again, a whole bunch of data, or, but it shows you the process. I won't go through all that, but it's uh, reviewing this, the information the province had done, I don't know, 30 years ago. These maps are really old. So that was part of the reason we updated it. So you can see on the right, this is the Englishman River when it hits the uh, ocean. So in brown is when the sea level rise mapping hits the river mapping, um, but it shows that uh, gradation. And then what we've done is updated our flood management bylaw that was approved by the board in June. And they approved us to do a development permit area, which will now determine the flood construction level. So that's how we've implemented that, all of that updated risk and mapping. Next slide, please. This shows you uh, the old island highway, 19A going underwater, one of the RDN's wells going underwater, all the red are the houses in the end of the Englishman estuary that have gone underwater, the green ones are little islands. This shows you the impacts. Uh, that is the highest one 200 year uh, flood um, in year 2100. Next slide. And just quickly, this is our corporate, no, sorry, our community plan. We uh, put out a call to get seven integrated professionals, so engineers, planners, foresters, me, all those people, hydrogeologists, um, to come in and uh, assist us in developing this plan, which we uh, got approved by the board in December of 2021. It deals with both adaptation and mitigation. And the approach was to have low carbon, low risk, uh, resilience, maximum co-benefits, integrated actions, and focused effort. Next slide. All three components are required for uh, success of those three. Um, and just so you know, I um, you can only do three to five priorities. Um, a list of anything more than that is simply a list. So the, I get angered when we do sustainability stuff or environmental stuff, and we end up with uh, 200 or 120 priorities. Those aren't priorities, it's just the list. And what I told this group is that you will have three to five priorities and that's it. We had a whole process to go through with the spreadsheet, including um, the uh, social equity lens to go through this process, but we came up with three priorities. I put that in the 2022 budget and we're now in, uh, going into, <clears throat> pardon me, the third year of implementation. If you had left me with 120 priorities, I would have had to figure out what the priorities are and not that committee, which is what its job was. I would have to figure out how to get it through the budget process and through the corporation. And I might be just getting it in the 2024 budget now. We're now entering the third year by doing, by only having three. 
Um, and next year, actually, we are now going, we have a new CATAC committee, uh, meets twice a year. We're reporting next year formally on our three years of, of work and then rolling into and establishing our next three year work program. We don't have time, as you already know, uh, gravy days are gone of having time to do this. You have one of these climatic events and you spend most of your time recovering from it and you don't have the luxury of doing these things, um, or at least not as well as uh, we could. Um, so you need to do this stuff now. And do you wanna give me the, th bring the next slide up please? So this is the criteria and I, I'm just gonna show that to you so you can take a look through that. Um, but it said immediate action within one to two years, as I said, co-benefits uh, and equity lens, uh, ratio GHGs, all of those things. Within our legislative authority, we're not wandering around and deciding what to do on the moon. We don't have authority on the moon. We're not leaving at lunch to go to the moon, but we can do development permit areas, right? So that's uh, part of that and it addresses risks. Anyway, you switched that, but that was the criteria we had for, I think we started off with 120 suggestions for priorities. Can you give me the next slide, please? First one is water supply resilience. Second priority is review RDN policies and bylaws to remove barriers to climate mitigation and adaptation. Third one is increased support for home energy adaptation retrofits. They added two more in the bottom, just to slide it in case we had any at any time. It's food security and increased energy efficiency and decarbonization of buildings. That's actually the last one we're uh, starting work on. We actually have a program we just launched, concierge service, for example. So. Uh, those are the priorities that came out the other uh, for us to work on. Next slide, please. So that's what our plan is for 20 to 24. So uh, again, and I have time, which I'm, I think I'm running out of here, but I said, I'll, I'll, uh, I can talk to you about our development permit areas, which we used uh, in electoral area F. We're updating their quarter of a century year old official community plan and a community that didn't want regulation 25 years ago, their number one thing they wanted was environmental protection through our three rounds of engagement. So we have developed an aquifer protection development permit area based on our drinking water and watershed protection program, uh, understanding and mapping of our aquifers and uh, from the natural asset inventory condition and risk assessment uh, that I did a year and a half ago. So that's how we're implementing it to protect increasingly uh, risky uh, aquifers are uh, under a lot of uh, a, a lot of risk a lot of uh, demand at the moment so uh, that's how we're managing to deal with that um, but anyway you can ask me some questions on any of those if you're interested but it says those are uh, the ones we're just completing next year next slide please we have a corporate carbon neutral plan that deals with our corporate processes yeah and just keep going through. And again, just as I said, you can I probably have a copy of this so you can take a look at. But again, we just uh, did it based on risk um, and analysis of greenhouse gases. So maybe, next one. Maybe we can, Aaron, if you can Google those and pop them in the chat so folks can yeah. read, read them yeah. and that'll save some time for questions. Okay. And one of the things I'm just going to tell you at the end of the slide, I, I left a uh, link to a FCM asset management video that was done a few years ago and it's excellent. It's only four minutes long. Um, and it really helps um, to understand uh, if you if you have to explain it to your board or your council or to uh, just you know staff to make an understand it's very useful. Uh, does a lot of this stuff in four minutes uh, to explain the basics the basic assessment. Anyway, I hope that helps. Sorry, I had the delay of running around with my technology. Oh no, that's no excellent. No, uh, don't mean to rush you at all. Just wanted to make sure folks we can also delay our schedule as well. So much information that you're sharing, mm -hmm. um, really relevant and, and helpful. I just wanted to open it to the table. Um, there's a lot of information that was just shared. I'm sure people are processing, but uh, we wanted just to create some space for conversation. Um, does anyone have any uh, you know, yeah, comments? I, I, I do. Uh, we did our asset management plans and you know, fleet and IT was easy enough. But roads, water mains, sewers, you know, that's done through planning and engineering, GIS. Uh, but our, our asset management plans aren't connected. Well, our capital, 
program that we identify, our capital projects that we identify every year are not necessarily connected to the asset management plans. Uh, in fact, when we, in Fort St. John, when we project over five years, the first year out, yeah, we'll have a complete and comprehensive capital program, but the second year is a little less so, and the third year, fourth year, and fifth year, uh, even less and less and less uh, as compared to when we did the asset management plans going 20 years out. Um, uh, so it's not connected to our, you know, we don't take the asset management plan for 2024 and insert it into our capital budget. That doesn't happen. And uh, I think, I don't know how the other municipalities are doing it, but uh, ours are definitely not connected. And uh, yet we know we are fortunate uh, in North Peace, especially in Fort St. John, that we receive Peace River Agreement money which finances our 70% uh, of our capital program. Uh, so we don't necessarily have an infrastructure gap uh, from year to year to year, short term. Yeah, and that's the balance or it, it's, it's making those changes gradually um, about having it. I know in 2009, when I was the director of sustainability with the city of Victoria, uh, we did a report to the board showing a 1.2 billion dollar infrastructure funding gap um, and did a condition assessment on the stuff that we had. I think the only thing we hadn't done were parks buildings, but one of them was over 100 years old. Eh, was a storage bin. <laughs> so, um, you know, it, it's it's a process uh, to grad, you know, you do what you can. Uh, but what I find is if you have that conversation with your board or council to understand what there's a funding gap or you have this, you know, key or I call it the core or base infrastructure, that's the base budget. That's, you know, the long, both the short term and the long term. And that can be built, should be built. Um, and then you can start having a, a conversations with the councils and the boards and you don't understand why, um, you know, uh, you can't afford to do some of these other things. And that's um, uh, the new, I call it the new and sexy or attractive stuff to do. Um, whereas, and I think uh, Christina Benti is one of the uh, very good communicators on this because she was a former mayor in the town of Golden. Um, your new and sexy stuff is your asset management plan and changing that perspective uh, to uh, being stewards and it, your legacy is is uh, replacing, your, replacing and maintaining your infrastructure and keeping those basic core services going and having that conversation. Um, and yes, sometimes it's hard, but as I said, at least to be able to give them that information. I, I'm a, I think the asset management plans, when they're developed, are still on a, in a way, a theor theoretical basis, whereas mm -hmm. the practical uh, plan is what we do in, for our capital budgets one to five years out. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm had a lot to do with the development of our asset management plans, but you know, once the roads get set uh, through GIS uh, and our data through that and the conditions, uh, we don't update the asset wow. management plan. Yeah. Then you have operationalized it. Um, and that's that's key. And, and then you come back at some point and review your asset management plan. But essentially, you've put most of that into um, your budgeting system, whether that's GIS or, or other uh, systems. And so that's an improvement. So you have put in some of that risk. You have put in some of that replacement. And what I find is uh, you can hire a lot of consultants and buy a lot of software that's particularly not helpful. We run a lot of asset management stuff, so off uh, Excel spreadsheets. Just have the conversation with your staff. Because I know the city of Vancouver, our big, you know, lauded uh, municipality, uh, the city manager, I don't know, 15 years ago, just simply pulled together all the senior staff and said, what are our key assets? What are our key risks? And that's how they ran their asset management plan for the first of all. And then they brought in the information. But your staff already know how, you know, what are the key risks and key areas to work on. Thanks, Kim. Anybody else have a question? To, such a valuable resource we have with us this morning. Yeah, I'm pinch hitting for Wally Wells. He's on a cruise. Uh, mm -hmm. So sorry, I said I was running around trying to finish this last night. Um, uh, but I said he he's uh, an extraordinary asset management person. But I said I, I uh, mm -hmm. filling in for him. Thank you. Any other last questions for Kim before we go to break?
Well, Kim will still exist after this meeting. So you can always read it. I'm sure you can always reach out. Kim, this was a request to share your slides. Is that okay if we can share your slides? If you Yeah, if you have any questions on it, just, I knew I, I, I thought I would run out of time uh, without uh, trying to figure out screens, but it said the, uh, uh, just gave you some examples of the works so that you have an understanding and, and trying to pull down, it said lovely definitions, lovely theory, but actually in practice, how do these things work and showing the integration uh, across asset management, climate action, in this case, land use planning in yeah. particular of how that works.